Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Rejuvenate Edition 2. Uh, we have a very special guest today uh, uh, with us, and he is uh, YB Dr. Mazli Male, who is the Member of Parliament of uh, Simpang Ringam, as well as the former Education Minister of Malaysia. Salam pagi kepada tuan-tuan dan puan-puan, adik-adik uh, yang sedang menonton sekarang. Uh, kami ada tetamu khas pada hari ini uh, iaitu YB Dr. Mazli Malik uh, yang merupakan adun untuk Simpang Renggam dan juga mantan uh, Menteri Pendidikan Malaysia. YB, good morning to you. Ya, yeah, good morning to you too. Selamat pagi. Sehat? Sehat, sehat. Alhamdulillah. Uh, YB, uh, I, I've been following your your Twitter and 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 obviously you know your your movements uh, during the entire pandemic, um, and I understand that you know that there's a lot of work that has been done uh, in, in Simpang Ringam. I, I I applaud you. I applaud your team for for the tireless uh, work uh, during this pandemic. Um, perhaps you could just share with us a little bit. Uh, what the situation is in in uh, you know especially in Simpang Ringgam. Uh, first and foremost, thank you very much, Andrew, for inviting me to rejuvenate. Terima kasih. And uh, I would like to thank the audience for listening and for watching this uh, program. Okay, uh, talking about Simpang Ringgam, I think it's similar to anywhere else in Malaysia. Uh, the situation, everybody has been. Uh, put inside their house and everybody wanted to stay safe, staying at home. And of course, there are movements here and there. People need to go to work. People need to earn. But with a strict as uh, self-imposed SOPs amongst themselves. Uh, but the situation, just like in other places, uh, people are facing a lot of difficulties in, uh, uh, in, 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 in working, in earning. To be honest, a lot of business people are suffering at the moment. And a lot of uh, people lost their jobs, especially those who used to work in uh, outside Simpangam. The moment they came back, they lost their job. And a few of them, they used to work in Singapore and they lost their job uh, to stay in Simpangam. And it was very devastating for them. Uh, apart from that, I think uh, children and the parents alike are struggling with the online classes. Thank God uh, it has. Uh, uh, it's it's a school term holiday at the moment, but they're going to go back for the online classes in the coming uh, weeks. But uh, they too are struggling with their own problem. Uh, the lack of devices, I mean appropriate devices to be used uh, for the learning session, online learning session, and also the poor coverage on internet. Hence, you see on my mm -hmm. <laughs> social media how I brought all the telcos to come to Separangam and go to every corner of the Kampung, <laughs> Velda, Taman, all those places to show to them that people are people are suffering and people need good, not only good, but excellent quality of internet coverage uh, for, to, to, to continue their life. Students, uh, I mean, uh, work uh, em, 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 em employees and others, uh, and even the, the old folks, you know, they're the children, they're, they're staying in Semparangam. But most of the children, they, 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 they left Semparangam to work either in KL or JB. Yeah. JB is closer, lah. Tapi KL and some of them living abroad, even in Singapore and elsewhere, uh, they, they couldn't come back. So uh, the only thing that uh, they could communicate is through uh, video conference. And 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 the children, I mean, the, the children, they are, they're, they're very worried about the condition of their parents. Yes, mm -hmm. they can communicate through the phone, but again, they would like to see the condition of their parents. Hence, mm -hmm. they too need a good internet coverage. Because, so this, yeah. uh, this is why I I insisted uh, to, to get good internet coverage for the whole uh, Semparangam parliamentary uh, area. Yeah. What why be for, for the benefit uh, obviously for our our global audience uh, today and 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 those who will watch it uh, after the live session as a video on demand uh, I am going to be uh, you know going through the, the entire session with you uh, in, in dual languages so so dengan easy and YP saya akan boleh, boleh, bahasa, boleh, ya? boleh. Uh, 
of, of course un, untuk uh, faedah penonton kita di Malaysia dan juga penonton kita di luar negara nanti. Uh, I, I guess for for the benefit of our uh, flow. Ni ni ke yi chang hoi ma. Ah ke yi ke yi. I understand why I know. <laughs> I understand why we can uh, can you speak a little bit of Hakka? No. No. Okay. No. <laughs> I only have Hakka in my blood but but not the language. <laughs> So, so but for, few for swearing the... words. I don't want to mention it here. Ah, few swearing <laughs> hakka words, but it's not appropriate to mention it here. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, YB, uh, I guess for the benefit of our global audience as well, uh, perhaps uh, could you give us a, a little bit of a background of who Dr. Mazli Male is and, and, and you know, what, what have you been doing throughout your time and, and perhaps just, just give us a... a, a an overview of your career so far. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a bit awkward to talk about myself, but in brief, I will share. Yeah, I mean, I was formerly a, a lecturer in, in uh, International Islamic University, but while I was lecturing, I heavily got involved with uh, humanitarian uh, organizations and do a lot of NGO works. So, you know, you could see that whenever, whatever I'm doing, it's only continuing what I've done in, in, in my previous life. <laughs> and uh, I still remember those days, I got involved not only with NGO in Malaysia, when I had the opportunity to spend a few years abroad, I also got involved with uh, some of the NGOs abroad and uh, came back the year 2011, early 2011, and started teaching back at uh, International Islamic University. And uh, then I got involved with uh, a lot of public debates as a moderator. So you remember the, the most infamous one was the debate between Rafizi, Ramli, uh, I mean, the, 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 the most popular young opposition politician then with the uh, minister, uh, with Kairi Jamaluddin who I'm not sure whether he was a, a minister then, but he was a Ketua Pemuda AMNO, the AMNO Youth Chief. So that was my debut as a, as a moderator for political uh, for debates and political forum. Uh, yes, I taught politics in, in uh, IUM, but uh, I, I never thought I would got involved in, in, in politics. I, I, I was then very complacent with the way in advocating certain uh, policies and doing certain uh, NGO activities rather than going into the political debacle and fights and skirmish like what they were having now. But again, uh, towards uh, the 2018 general election, I think that there was the call. I mean, a lot of people uh, invited and I could see that I should jump into the bandwagon to bring change to Malaysia. Um, yeah after discussing with my uh, family <clears throat> members, especially my mom and my wife, and, you know, the, the call is there. So I decided to leave academia and jump to politics. So after the election, a month after winning the Semparangam uh, constituency, I, I watched my name appear on the telly that I was appointed as the Minister of Education then. So it's in line with whatever I was uh, struggling during my life as an academia, fighting for the rights of the, uh, my, uh, the rights of the uh, disabled uh, community, you know, fighting for the rights of the marginalized people in, in terms of education and a lot of other things. Uh, so I was trying my best then to bring a lot of policy changes, I think for the freedom of academia, fighting for the freedom of student movement, establishing student unions and those sorts of things and trying to bring uh, a new dimension to uh, Malaysian education then. But politics was very, it's a very, it's a very, or was a very, is a very different uh, ball game altogether. So I thought only by fighting for policies is enough. But again, actually in politics, you have to play politics you have to communicate uh, strategically and cunningly. And, you know, there are a lot of arts that I learned along the way. So whatever I tried to do, whatever I, I, I've done then 
was never been picked up by by the people and uh, what i received was political mock from every corner of the society and then and and and, and hence a lot of what we we have done was never been paid attention until i was asked by the prime minister then to give back the uh, ministerial post to him so after i handed back then only people realize oh he has done this he has done that and you know after the government collapsed people started to realize what well, this is what he's trying to do you know <laughs> all those kind of things and but it was too late change of government i was no longer there and with the new government they just scrap away whatever uh, good policies that we have uh, tried to to put in place uh, for betterment of malaysian education system then but uh, the rest is history it has been nearly 2 years and thank you for uh, pushing me to <laughs> uh, uh, lament all those things <laughs> but inshallah I will, I will i will try to pen some of them into my upcoming book uh, in bahasa but i'm working parallelly to translate it into english as well and uh, mandarin i'm trying <laughs> few friends I'm, just, I'm helping me yeah what why be just, just a short yes or no answer from you rewind yeah. back to 2018 would you take up that post again yes definitely and uh this I'll be more prepared and it's not uh, one one man show game is going to be a teamwork uh game because then uh although we were having pakatan harapan government so it was a it was a first time for all the ministers so all ministers thought that they wanted to give the best for the nation and they're struggling in silos you know rather than working as a team everybody was trying to do all their best sleepless nights you know countless hours but they forgot one thing that at the end of the day is all about politics it's not about what you're trying to prove what you're trying to do or what you have done is about the story that you narrate to the people the story the, the narrative that you want the people to be convinced doesn't matter how smart how good your policies are but if the people are not convinced and they are convinced with other petty things that being well sugar coated presented by your uh, opponents or by you know by anybody whatever you have done <laughs> vaporized uh, through the thin air <laughs> so we have learned a lot we have learned a lot and this time i think uh, is going to be uh, a better journey in compared to the previous one <laughs> okay okay that, that's good to know so so why be just just to uh, get everyone uh, up to speed uh, rejuvenate to addition to this time around is obviously to in conjunction with uh, world youth skills day uh it is celebrated by uh everyone in the world uh, it, it is an event that first kick started by uh, the united nations and and 15 july is, is the actual day for it so we we try to to be in line with with that as well um i i guess moving on to that team then um can you briefly during your time share with us how important was tvet in 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 your policy making uh was it something that you were wow, looking TVET. at to yeah was was it something that you were looking at to 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 overhaul to to revamp yeah, yeah. to to you talking about about something that have not been heard since ages <laughs> the last time we heard the word tvet was the year 2019 <laughs> it was the end of 2019 and then nobody talks about it anymore it was not a, a sexy thing to be discussed by by anybody anymore uh, i mean i really appreciate I, i mean i would give you an applause for what uh, you have done and for mentioning that again you know because if you still remember during our days 2018 2019 almost every day you heard the word tvet and it was not only by the minister of education but everybody was, was talking about tvet I still remember my colleague Kula Segaran, uh, Webi Kula Segaran was in charge of the Ministry of uh, Works. He talks about TVET. Said Sadik was a Minister of Youth. 
he talks about TVET, yeah. and uh, we we even we had uh, a few others talking about TVET, and even the 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 mass media, the social media, people talking about TVET and trying to uh, make TVET as part of the uh, uh, what we call it uh, uh, first choice of the people. Or they're trying to bring it as the mainstream. Mainstream, uh, yes. Uh, mainstream. But uh, it is very unfortunate. Since the change of government, people are, are not talking about TVET anymore. Yes, I heard there was a, a TVET council that had been established. That was our dream then that we have yet managed to accomplish. And then government changed. Uh, but uh, we didn't see anything happening. Unlike those days, as you remember, part of our... Uh, promises in our manifesto is to make TVET or turn TVET into mainstream and as one of the first choices that we had uh, for the, not only for the youth but also for, the, for adults because we believe in lifelong learning and we believe in second chance for people and actually TVET is the way. So as I remember those days, I'm talking about uh, uh, effort that had been done by Pakatan Harapan government because Tibet was governed by nine ministries. <laughs> Just imagine. Under Miti, they have their Tibet. Under KPM, we have the most uh, Tibet institutions. Under Work Ministry, under KBS, KDN, yes. you just name them. Uh, even under uh, what uh, Defense Ministry, they have their own Tibet institution. So under these nine uh, ministries, we have managed to establish uh, what we call then as the TVET National Committee. Yeah. Although it has been led by the ministers, but we are moving towards the industry-led TVET. Mm. Hence, the appointment of Tan Sri So, uh, who was, I think he's still, and who was then too, the chair of FMM, Federation of uh, Malaysian Manufacturers. Not only that, we tried to benchmark, uh, uh, benchmarking ourselves with Germany. So I still remember those days when I was communicating closely and frequently with uh, a lot of German uh, counterparts, not only the, the German embassy, but also uh, Malaysian German uh, Chamber of Commerce. Until today, I'm still communicating with them. I said, keep myself updated. And they say, nothing to update. Because unlike those days, now, now nothing happened, and you. I still remember. Uh, I, I'm sure you still remember the letter they sent to the government uh, a few weeks ago, and that's only part of their disappointments uh, towards our current government. But then it was very interesting. It was very rigorous the approach that been taken by not only by Minister of uh, Ministry of Education but uh, other ministries as well. So I still remember then. We tried to benchmarking ourselves with Germany. We tried to cooperate with them. And even we were, we, we were on our way to, to accredite our uh, qualifications with the Germans. Mm -hmm. We have done that at the first level with uh, the universities. Because, you know, when you talk, you talk about uh, TVET, uh, at least in the Ministry of Education, we have two levels of TVET the school levels and also tertiary level. School yeah. level, you have a scholar, uh, college vocational from form four uh, towards uh, whatever level that they, had, they, 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 need to, they need to accomplish. And the tertiary level is divided into few institutions. It's either they go to uh, technical universities, we have four of them, UNIMAP, UTEM, UMP, and uh, what's another one? But we have four. And we have also polytechnics, and we have five polytechnics that have been recognized as uh, world-class polytechnics. Yes. Uh, people never recognize it because Tibet was never a sexy thing for <laughs> major people. People prefer academic qualifications rather than skills qualification. Mm -hmm. and, and the other one is for lifelong learning, which is the a community college. Actually, what I learned then when, when, when the previous government started to establish community college, they're trying to emulate the UK model, which was successfully done. But when I came there, 
I thought there's a lot of uh, rooms for improvement and we tried to improve, especially to open it for the marginalized communities like the disabled communities, the Orang Asli, and the, the, the B40. So we tried to improve. Um, at the end of the day, we, we are trying to put ourselves at par with Germany. People would ask me, why Germany? Why not looking at Australia? Why not looking at Korea or Japan? I mean, to be honest, Germany is the best place of Tibet. Right. That's the best. But again, they are being led by the industry. Government there only assists them. They're, they're coming out with certain policies. They're coming out with, with a lot of uh, you know, regulations that, that will, that will uh, assist uh, the development of TVET. But TVET then was led by business guilds. And this is what we have in our mind. We want the industry to take the lead of the TVET because they know the best what type of skills, what type of uh, working force that they want. And I mean, they have all the idea to, to come up with their own accreditations, their own qualifications, and their own uh, regulations. And our job as a government is only to put all those things into policies to assist that. And if we are serious to become a developed nation, we need to make TVET as our mainstream. And that was part of our, uh, let me say, uh, effort. Uh, towards achieving that goal. Sorry to boring you with this. No, <laughs> no, lama lama. <laughs> YB, this is interesting because uh, uh, the, the session that we had uh, on, on the first day, uh, on Thursday, uh, was actually uh, talking about industry-led uh, TVN. So, yep. so we had guests from uh, Marika Space, we had guests from STI College Malaysia and, and of course the executive director of uh, Hong Leong Foundation to, to come in and talk about it. And, and, and we, we spoke about a, re, a, a range of things. And, and one of the things that, that was brought up was obviously the amount of money that was poured in uh, or, or, or rather mentioned uh, during budget uh, for, for TVET. Uh, and and it, there was this agenda for it to be industry led and, and whatnot. But, but as I spoke to, to uh, you know, people on the ground. Uh, Nothing uh, happened. Back, you know, it, it seems like we are still in square one or, or, or not even in square one itself. We haven't even started. And, and, and the there was no square. Is, <laughs> there you go. So <laughs> the, the scary fact is also this, uh, YB, you, you, you were talking about benchmarking with Germany, which, which you know, anyone anywhere in the world knows when it comes to TVET, Germany is the is the is the yes. blue ribbon, right? Yeah. It is the gold standard. Mm -hmm. But even in Germany now, uh, one of the latest articles that, that we were discussing uh, two days back, Germany themselves are already revamping, yep. putting an overhaul to their vet education. Yeah, yeah. And, and here we are, we have not even properly. Yeah. But but you look at their level; they are up there. We are still here. <laughs> so, and I still remember what uh, triggered me most was my second visit to China. I had an opportunity to had a meeting with the <clears throat> was it the deputy uh, prime minister? I think she was I, because I went there with Kawan, and part of the discussion it was about uh, Tibet, and for them. They're looking up to Germany. They said they're trying to implement German TVET system in China. Just imagine, mm -hmm. it's China. It's China <laughs> and yeah. So I told Kawan then, who was the deputy prime minister, I said, we're on the right track. Mm. We would never be wrong. We're on the right track. Uh, but we need to push ourselves beyond the comfort zone. And we need to really seriously working closely with, 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 with Germany. And I still remember talking about TVET. Sometimes, you know, uh, you know, we put the blame on ourselves. We did not really give a good, clear, and convincing uh, message on, on, on what TVET is all about. Normally, you, you talk about TVET, people are, uh, are having in their mind people wearing the, the, the yellow helmet and pachukang boots, you know, carrying spanners. And that's not only about TVET, you know. Yeah. Sometimes 
if you put that image on TV, you will convince nobody. <laughs> and people keep thinking about, okay, need third, third choice, fourth choice, and maybe the last choice is maybe the tens on the list. But if you're talking about high TV, you're talking about being the master chef, Gordon Ramsay, for example, that's part of the TV. You're talking about, you know, becoming a, a computer uh, uh, programmer. programmer, you know, uh, coding, you're talking about gamification, you're talking about, you know, all those sorts of skills. And then you would open a new horizon for the understanding of TVAD amongst yeah. our people. That's what we fail. I have to admit that. I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry, Malaysians. I mean, we did not really uh, promote TVAD as it should be. But anyway, it's better than what the current government is doing. <laughs> but there's still room for improvement. Should there's a second choice, we, we make it better. And still remember, talking up, uh, you're talking about TVAD in Germany. You know what is the first thing coming to, uh, I mean, the, the, the common uh, German uh, mind? It's about the car industries. <laughs> and it's about the culture of perfection. I, need, I still remember I, I, when I was invited there, we, we, we had a few meetings with the, uh, the, the body that in charge of TVAT for the whole Germany on behalf of the associations. Uh, I couldn't pronounce it properly, but you know, that is the highest body of, of TVAT. Mm. The gist that I learned from them is the culture of perfection. For Germany, for Germans, they cannot touch a spanner unless they have certain qualification. <laughs> they cannot touch the, the, the PowerPoint at, at your house unless they have certain uh, certificate with them. Why? Is it about the certificate? No, it's about perfection. They want to make sure only professionals, only skillful workers that do all those jobs for the well-being of the people. Even to cook, you need a certificate to certify you as a, as a professional cook, even to work in a restaurant. You just imagine that. That's how, that's the level of the Germans. I came back to Malaysia and I gave a briefing to my officer. I said, I thought the Japanese are at this level. I went to Germany and trying to understand they are beyond that level. <laughs> so this is why we decided to emulate, to embrace and to work and to collaborate with the Germans in order to further improve our TVET uh, industry, uh, our TVET education. YB, I, I just want to bring to, to a point and in, in, in fact segue towards our next, uh, so to speak, uh, discussion. You, you, you mentioned two things there that I want to touch upon again. Uh, one is obviously not Tibet not being uh, sexy, not being uh, the first choice. So a, a lot of parents uh, today are, are still thinking of Tibet as, uh, you know, academically inferior, yep. last resort. Uh, in, in fact, in, in Thailand, when they launched Thailand 4.0 as well, you know, there, there is this huge problem of, of uh, a drop in, in, in terms of uh, people taking up Tibet as, as a choice of education, right? Um, how can we change that perception? So I, I know you touch upon it a little bit, you know, creating better awareness, uh, the messaging could be better. It, it's no longer... The, the Pochukang boots holding the, the spanner and whatnot. Uh, you know, why, why, why is that? It, 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 how can we move from that perception of, of it being academ academically inferior? Uh, would it help if it's TVET led? Because then, you know, like, like the Malays say, right? Kabule, uh, kabule Pasaran. You know, you, you, you need to be coming out to be marketable in, in, the, in, 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 the, in the workforce. And, and TVET, in fact, has, has proven that, you know, you have TVET qualification, people are just going to snap you up like that because there is demand. Mm -hmm. But why is that mindset still, still not? Oh, yeah. I, I guess, why, why can't we think like the Germans, I suppose? Okay, there are two things. Okay, okay before we, 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 we touch these two things, you did ask uh, about why uh, the Germans are not having such uh, mentality or attitude. 
just like I mentioned earlier, TVET has been there for more than 100 years. <laughs> they have been there since the beginning of the industries. But why be TVET has been here as well, what, 1964 or something like that? It has been established since, you yeah. know, 64. But as a second choice. And it continued to be so. <laughs> it never been improved. It never been further developed. It never been pushed towards a proper benchmarking. Uh, benchmarking sorry. So that, that, that's our problem. We still start with a lot of old policies that we thought they are evergreen. I don't want to touch about the higher education policies that we were trying to improve then, but that there was part of it when people talk about matriculation and whatnot, but let's not talk about that yet. But we start with our 80s and 90s uh, achievement, and we thought that that's the best. While people moving uh, forward, you know, in the 80s, what is China? What was China then? And now, where is China in compared to us? Yeah. In the, in, in the 80s, where was Korea? And Korea, now, yeah. where is Korea now? And even if, you, if you're looking at certain Eastern European countries and, uh, let me say, Central Asian countries, where were they? And where are they now? But we still stuck. And we are not aware that we keep regressing bit by bit, bit by bit. And people are talking about like Malaysia is somewhere over there. But in reality, we stuck in the 80s and 90s. But anyway, let's not talk about that. That's coming back to your question. So uh, answering to your question, there are two things. Number one, let me say, uh, if you realize that, yes, you hit the nail on the head when you said that, the employment rate among the graduates, TVET graduates, is nearly 100%. It's 90, uh, 96. During my days, it was 96. Mm -hmm. But the starting, point of, uh, the starting point of the salary is a bit debatable. And this is where I was trying to push uh, a lot for TVET to be led by the industry so the starting point of the salary would be higher than what it is now. And the industry agreed. They said how they how in the world they wanted to rise the entering point if the students did not have a proper skill that they wanted. So this is where we're trying closely with, 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 with the industry and we wanted it to be industrial-led and we're working with the Germans to make sure that our qualification is German uh, certified qualification. Is Germany qualified certification? So the entry point to the workplace, the entry point for the salary would be higher. That was a solution that we were trying to do. But again, the rest is history. <laughs> but so the employment rate, in compared to the employment rate of the university graduates, the academic graduates, we're still talking about it. I still remember the other day when. Uh, said Sadiq was interviewed by others and he said that, oh, it's all because of the uh, subjects taught in the universities. Yes and no, because I was a minister of education. I know what the problem is. It's not, it's not about that. It's about the, the, what we're trying to, uh, uh, it's not about the, the subject, but it's about what we're trying to uh, what achieve throughout the tertiary uh, education. And this is where I think we, we, we talk in, in some other time about the reform in the higher education that we were trying to do and how are we going to accelerate the, the, the employment rate. But that's totally different issue. Let's come back to the TVET issue. Okay. So uh, we were trying to, to make sure that not only the employment rate, but also the quality of our TVET graduates. But unfortunately, that did not happen. Should that happen after two years when we're trying, I'm sure that TVET graduates now are enjoying much better than what they're enjoying now. And, you know, by then, TVET could be acknowledged as part of the mainstream and it will make people like Malaysia's Chile Mata again. Mm. When the entry point is more than 2,000 ringgit, who, who doesn't want? <laughs> In compared yeah. to university graduates, you know? So, this is where we're trying our best, trying to benchmark ourselves with Germany, trying to make our qualification certified by the Germans with German uh, Germany qualification. 
and also trying to uh, make it uh, led by the industry. So the industry recognize it, the industry recognize. So that would be a totally different package for, for TVAC. And number two, the second thing is there was not much, uh, let's say, uh, propaganda of TVAC. But again, you want to make a propaganda without substance is useless. Hmm. I did mention that then, you still remember, almost every day we talk about TVET, but again, people couldn't see the result. People want to see the result. If we could come with a better narrative, should whatever we have started being implemented within these two years, mm -hmm. we could see the fruit now with a higher paid salary at the entry point, you can make a good propaganda, make a comparison. So people will open their eyes. But again, at the end of the day, Andrew, uh, because of what we did not do, we are killing a lot of potentials among our citizens. Sometimes parents, when they have a straight A student, they have a straight A child, they thought that, okay, my child should be a medical doctor. If not, then a uh, uh, dentist, a dentist. If not, then a lawyer. That was a very typical developing country mindset. Sometimes this trade is, is a future Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> we don't need Gordon Ramsay to come to Sunway to open his restaurant. We should have our own. And sometimes who knows that this trade A child is going to be Jeff Bezos. He's going to be, I don't know who, whoever who, who invented the Minecraft game, but definitely now he or she is a super millionaire. And he would be, you know, the straight A child of him, instead of sending him just to be any typical uh, medical doctor who are now doing their strike or whatever, should they choose TVET, the high TVET, the digitalized TVET or whatever, they might have been the engineer for F1 uh, cars. You know, who knows? I mean, and trust me, the way we're we are, we, are, we, are, we are leading our education at the moment. We're killing a lot of potentials. And on, on the expense of this <laughs> academic, whatever, I mean, they went to academia, ended up as unemployed graduates. But if they choose TVET, definitely they're going to be employed. If we having a German certified uh, qualification, he or she or our potential students would be you know, working with BMW, Mercedes, with, you know, all those German com companies, whether in Malaysia or abroad. You know, this is what actually German wanted from us. When I talked to them, they said that they want all the talents from, from Malaysia, uh, but we, we disappointed them, we failed them. And, but again, should we have, should we have been given uh, a second chance, we would do it better. Why we just, just to summarize that, had, had it, been smooth flowing the last two years, an industry-led TVET system would have been in place. Uh, you, you're talking about memenuhi permintaan industry. That that obviously the, the key thing here because the industry would know what is required, yeah. right? So they work hand in hand. Collaboration is is, exactly. is there, mm -hmm. and and you know, the pasaran becomes an automatic thing at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's they, not only Mamunui Pemintan industry per se. Actually, we should put our vision uh, bigger than that. We are trying to make sure that Mamachu uh, Pembangunan industry <laughs> further develop. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. Of course, totally agree. And, and, and you know, um, Having said that, uh, you, you also touched a little bit on, on education in, in terms of uh, in, in school. I, I, I noticed that in universities, uh, it, it's always about preparing the students to be exam ready. Whereas TVET, like what you were saying, if, if it's going to be industry led, uh, you know, whether it's before, now or, or in the future, it, it is not going to be getting the students to be exam ready, getting the students to be workforce ready. So that, that's the true essence of, of future proofing the, the, the youths in, in terms of uh, future of work. 
and and I, I, I totally get your point, uh, YB. Uh, ha having said that, YB, uh, we, we do have a few questions uh, and, and before okay, I can move I... on to the next segment. Yes, please. Andrew, uh, when you say that uh, the credit should be, uh, what, employment ready? Uh, yes. I still it, remember it, a few yeah. uh, advertisements by uh, Chinese uh, businesses in China. I'm not talking about China. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the past, they were talking about uh, certain qualification. And uh, I still remember, they put academic qualification as on the top of it. But now, if you look at those China companies, they will put soft skills as, 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 as part of the requirements. The ability to work uh, in, in, in a different environment, ability to adapt uh, towards a different situation, problem solving, teamwork, decision making. They put that as part of the highest requirements. And you know, it reminds me of Jack Ma when he was asked about uh, education. He said education is not only about you know, your ability to, to conduct, to have a digital literacy. Yes, digital literacy is very important and it, the utmost important. But again, he said your ability to communicate with others, your ability to, to handle uh, problems, to, 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 to come up with solutions, mm -hmm. uh, your ability to work with others, your ability to, to, to adapt to different situations, and even Jack Ma touch a lot about that. And this is where I think our universities, during, <laughs> during our days, we introduced two new subjects to be taught in, in the university. Number one is philosophy, introduction to philosophy. And I, I received a lot of criticism. People said, oh, what is philosophy? Uh, they should be taught about uh, what uh, ethnic studies la, about this tamadun, uh, tamadun Asia, whatever. I thought they've learned a lot during their school days. They need to be upgraded. And what we learn from American universities, a lot of other universities, even the International Baccalaureate, they put introduction philosophy as a must for their students. Why? Because philosophy will teach students to think correctly, to think rationally, and to have a systemic thinking. What we have nowadays, people don't know how to think even. <laughs> no, what more to solve problems? They don't know how to communicate with each other. They don't know how to, to, to look at things from different point of views. Hence, we need philosophy. This is why I introduced introduction to philosophy. And uh, the, the second topic was ethics in, 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 uh, and, and uh, ethics and civilizations. This is where we're trying to put uh, a correct way of looking at life and looking at things amongst our graduates. The moment we have tuned them at the very beginning with these two skills, they're open to catapult themselves forward with, with other skills that they acquire throughout the way. So, and, and that was only the beginning. Actually, we, we, we also established a big data committee in Ministry of Education with the hope that our students will be guided by artificial intelligence. And the potential of our students since uh, their school days could be identified towards the end of their uh, schooling term. Until Form 5, you have a set of data about, one, about all the students with all their skills, their ability, their you know, uh, psychometric or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the artificial intelligence will help you, will help to assist the students and the families to identify in the next five to 10 years, what is this child potentially to be? You know, we have started that, but unfortunately what I heard after I left the ministry with the change of government, that uh, big data community has been closed down. And all those people that we invited from all these big companies, they've been sent back to, to their places. But again, with that idea, I still remember I was sharing this with uh, Chivening uh, scholars the other day that was organized by a British High Commission. I told them that we need this. Because what? Because I've witnessed, I mean, partly has been done by the government of Jordan. You know, Jordan, one of the Middle Eastern countries. Mm -hmm. When I left Jordan in 1999, Jordan was a desert. We were up there. 
with our MSC, with our Twin Towers and everything. But in, 2018, in 2019, early 2019, I visited them. The Minister, the minister of Higher Education asked me a very pertinent and very tricky question. He asked me how to avoid mismatching in, at the tertiary education that, led, that leads towards the uh, high graduate unemployment. You know, actually, I presented to him, I replied to him with very conventional answers, typical conventional answers. And then he just kept quiet and it intrigued me. I asked him, what about Jordan? Yeah, well, what's so special? Because when he keep quiet, it means that actually he's trying to imply to me that, okay, it is boring, whatever you said, it's a very conventional way in dealing with things. And then he said, no, no, he told me we, in Jordan, we are using artificial intelligence to solve that. <laughs> that struck me like thunderbolt. He said, what? Jordan is using artificial intelligence. And they showed me how they use it. And definitely they have the cooperation from their uh, industry uh, to forecast what the job opportunities, not only in Jordan, but abroad in the next five years or 10 years. So every student, before they choose what specialization that they want after here after SPM lah, or after STP, what specialization they, they, they wanted to do, what they wanted to be, is no longer like Malaysia, we, we depend on our parents. Lah. Parents, okay. oh, got straight A, ambil medic. Uh, kalau tak dapat medic, then you blame on government policies of uh, racial uh, quota, whatever. Whereas there is nothing to do. Tapi, you know, and people are, 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 are you know, are going towards apa ni, all those conventionally uh, popular but limited space of uh, specialization. But there, said, no, no, no. The moment you get your SPM result, or there they have different name for the SPM. Lah. Mm -hmm. They go to the computer, they go to the computer, and not only they fill in their uh, SPM results, but also whatever their achievement during high school, and then the AI, the computer will guide them. They said, okay, they are, for example, they're choosing four specialization. You said, after the next five years, this four specialization, the job opportunity for this one is 80%. Another one, only 10%. Only, and you can find a better one. You know, so it helps you to analyze. It helps you with the forecast. And at the end of the day, it guides you, it assists you and advise you the most suitable uh, profession for yourself. And then I learned that is not enough because I know that it means the psychometric elements. It means the big data from the very beginning of the child. And it means a lot of other activities. This is where I, I, I invited a few friends from, from different departments in Ministry of Education and from abroad, from Microsoft, from you know, all these big companies to come to MOE then three years ago. I mean, and I, I told them, is it possible to do this? Is it possible for our students, the moment they come into the school, we collect their data towards Form 5. And even before they, they go to Form 4, what stream they want to choose, they will be guided by artificial intelligence. They say that's... And they told me, it is very simple. It's doable. So I told them, work on it. And, but again, the rest is history. Otherwise, we're going to have a totally different education system at the moment. <laughs> I, sorry, I, I totally sorry, said. everybody, for boring you guys. No, no, that, that, that was obviously uh, needed and, and, and needed to be heard. And, and uh, we, we, we are very thankful that you are sharing so much with us today, YB. Uh, I, again, just, just to, to respect the audience as well, I, I just want to go into the questions very quickly and, and, and hopefully we can address them so that, uh, you know, we, we don't want to take up too much of YB's time as well. Uh, the, the first question is from Ali, actually. Uh, good morning, YB. How do you think the pandemic will affect the students' education in years to come? Currently, things aren't looking so bright for these students. So, so I, I guess perhaps, Waibi, um, let's touch a little bit on, uh, you, you know, I, I, I know you spoke about uh, PDPR, or online learning, uh, online teaching. We, we talk about the challenges of, of devices. Uh, there are students out there who 
cannot afford to have devices. So how then are they coping with online classes when, when there is a lockdown in the country? Uh, that then we, we also touched a little bit on, uh, uh, we, we also want you to touch a little bit, I mean, uh, on, on your thoughts on, on uh, 1st September as uh, supposedly the timeline to reopen schools again. Uh, so perhaps, uh, YB, you, you would like to answer Ali's question? Okay, before we go to Ali's question, I mean, I would like to respond to the 1st September opening of school. I think I've written an article about it in Bahasa yes. uh, two days ago, and um, I'm going to publish the English version of it uh, maybe today, late today or tomorrow okay. morning. But anyway, I've touched upon that. I mean, if they really want to open school, there are few stipulations that they need to fulfill. And otherwise, it will only be a spark for new clusters altogether. You know? sure. But again, uh, in responding to Ali's question, I think the biggest problem with our government now, and especially the Minister of Education, they come up with a blanket uh, decision by Putrajaya to the whole country. Hence, you, you, you're having these big issues of digital uh, disparity among people, among students. Hence, you're having the problem of uh, the lost generation. You know, when, when, when Putrajaya decided on something, they're trying to put schools in Subang Jaya and Bukit Damansara at par with schools in Pulau Bumbum, in Baram, in, in, in uh, uh, Gua Musang, and in uh, elsewhere, which is not right. I mean, at the moment, as is, since last year, I've told them that they need to empower the PPD, the, the, the district uh, education office, and they need to give autonomy to schools, whether to open or not and to choose the best way of their PDPR. Because, you know, if you're trying to put the same condition, the same uh, decision for schools in Putrajaya with schools in uh, Sipadan, you're, you're going to uh, you know, punish those, those students. They don't have good internet coverage and definitely they don't have uh, enough good devices, not only those people out there, even people in Sempalungam, when I went to certain kampung, and not only to kampung, even to taman-taman rumah, uh, rumah murah. You know, you can see all the pictures. I, I went yeah. to the houses to have a look at those children, and, and I even uh, bumped into students studying uh, under 10 in front of her house. And that's one, one of million other uh, examples that we have in Malaysia. And, and they... they, they the government started with the promise to give 150k laptops and whatnot. That's not the solution. The solution is you must not come up with a blanket uh, decision to for the whole country. You must empower the PPD and you must give autonomy to the schools to decide what the best way to teach a children in order to avoid uh, the lost generation. That's number one. And number two, uh, what I regretted most is uh, the Minister of Education never present to us their master plan for the post-COVID, uh, the post-pandemic uh, education system. Mm. What they're going to do with the lost generation? What they're going to do with the marginalized society who have missed their schooling for nearly a year? What are they going to do with them? What are they going to do with uh, with children at the grade one and grade two that uh, miss their classes for nearly a year and you would find nearly 50% of them are not able to read, write and count even. And uh, most of them, they don't have a proper uh, device uh, for studies. They did not have a proper internet connection and even their surrounding, their family are not able to teach them not what more to to, to educate them. So we, we haven't heard anything. I, I, I've been asking them in day one Rakyat since last year, show us a master plan and please convince us as Rakyat. We are worried about this. It requires 
a major radical and very unconventional policies and approach. And today, I'm not sure whether my media team has released my my another statement. I'm, I'm, I'm issuing uh, st a policy statement every day towards the the opening of the parliament on the uh, the lost generation. Yeah, so hopefully it would answer some of uh, Ali's question. I'm not sure whether uh, I did answer Ali's question. <laughs> We, we have, I, I think, a, a, a partial question, partial comment here, uh, and, and it's from uh, Saudara Arif Haida. Salam YB. Adakah sistem dan format pembelajaran sekarang masih relevan dan bagaimana untuk memperbaiki lebih baik? Kerana pembelajaran sewaktu zaman saya jauh lebih berlain berbanding anak-anak saya. Dan saya lihat pembelajaran anak-anak saya jauh lebih complicated. Okay, yeah, that's true. I mean, it's, it's not relevant anymore. We need to move forward. This is where I should remember. I, when I first step into the office, I said that we need a, a, a happy school, happy learning. Hmm. Now you're talking about learning. People could pick up, any the students could pick up a lot of things uh, from the internet. They could learn a lot of things out there. But our challenge is how the students are fully equipped at school in determining what is worth to be learned and what, is, what, are, what are those things are not worth to be learned. You know, we have been uh, presented with the diarrhea of, of, of information now. <laughs> How are we going to equip our students to verify what are useful and what's not? And how whatever information out there will assist them in, in their future life. So this is where school plays a very important uh, role in, in shaping the way how our students think, how our students embracing their worldview and how they look at life. But it should start with teachers. This is where I said when I first came into the office, uh, we say that we're going to leave the burden of teachers uh, of our teachers. We don't want them to be burdened with a lot of clerical job and unnecessary things that divert thing them away from their original uh, job, which is to educate the children. Kemenjadian uh, murid, what they call it. But more than that, it's not about kemenjadian murid, but to create a better way on on how to think correctly, how to think critically and analytically. Only teachers could impart that to the students. But if the teachers are being burdened with all those unnecessary reportings and redundant reportings, they don't have the time. And if the teachers are being told uh, to, to finish the syllabus without imparting any element of critical thinking and analytical thinking, it's going to be useless. You're going to produce, you know, people who could rot, rot things and memorize things, but are those things going to be useful and helpful in their future life or to develop the nation? I don't think so. This is where schools need to be a place to enhance the potential of every children. Some of the children they deserve to be Schumacher. Some of them they, they prefer to, uh, they, they, they deserve to be the future Mozart, for example. But with the current mindset that we have, with the current, uh, you know, exam-oriented system that we have, they're going to start within the, within the, the choice, not of theirs, but of the masses, of the parents. And we're not moving forward. We keep stuck in where we are. So this is where I think, uh, so remember, uh, in the year 2019, we, we declared that by the year 2020, we're going to introduce a kind of harmonization between the streams. Art stream students can take science yeah. subjects. Science students can take art subjects, TVET subjects, and you know, those kind of things. We want our students, since the second grade at the high school, 
I mean since they are apa tu tekatan 4 mm-hmm. they got exposed to different uh, subjects to different uh, specializations that will help them to determine what they going to be in the future uh, did i answer yeah, when yeah. <laughs> uh, and and maybe just i just wanted to mention something as well you, you you're talking about teachers i i think one of the key things that a lot of people uh, perhaps forget when you were in office is that you know you tried to make guru sebagai ter, uh, focus teras yes so, so that was that was crucial and 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 i, I you pointed out uh, about that really i i just wanted to uh, emphasize on that point uh, very very last question here uh yb from uh, our audience uh, mama izam uh he, he's he's saying here wow such enthusiasm from our former education minister talking about tvet dr mazli do you think with current covid 19 situation does it still is it still relevant for you to take up tvet so so i i think we spoke at length um Uh, about it but I, i just wanted to respect uh, our yeah. saudara here and 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 read out his his mention so so you you we, we spoke at length about how it, it is even more relevant today that that people take up tvet right uh, and and we we talk about uh, you know uh, a, a guaranteed uh, uh, employability and, and and things like yeah. that So, so maybe very quickly, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time today as well. I, I've got one little last question to to, to ask uh, before we wrap things up. Very quickly, maybe Dede TV. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts? It is a huge space for improvement. At the moment, it's not really helping. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's my very personal point of view. And what I received from the parents as well. It's okay. huge. We, 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 space okay. we, we will leave it at that, and then hopefully, we, 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 when time permits, we, we perhaps we can come back, uh, put on a, a roundtable discussion uh, with, sure. with people who 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 are you know uh, managing uh, Didet TV, I suppose. Um, very lastly, memory bukan memoir. That's the book that is uh, you you mentioned uh, earlier during our session. It, it is going to be published in uh, Bahasa. Uh, you, you, there is a version in English that is uh, hopefully going to be coming up. Uh, a little snippet of of what to expect from the book, Wadi. Yeah, I would. I, mean, I would like. Uh, I would like to see that this book will further guide whatever policies uh, that. The future government is is going is trying to 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 come up with. I mean, at least I would like to express what we have started, what we have done, what uh, we're trying to achieve. But you know, the rest is history. So I hope that future governments would try to have a look at it and try to further improve whatever we have done and what we have tried to to do. Yeah, and. There are a lot of trivia as well. People keep asking a uh, lot about a uh, few things that they would find answer in that book, and amongst that, amongst them is uh, why did I give back my uh, position to the then prime minister? I did answer in that book. Okay, so so definitely, <laughs> it, it's a it's a book to look out for, and, and and for our overseas audience, if if you are interested, why be there? There is. Uh, a way to to buy it online yes uh, definitely definitely we try to Fantastic. to sell it online so. okay so so j- just to wrap things up a little bit uh yb i i just want to for for the benefit of of uh, our audiences here and and of course uh, i i will find a way to translate this into english later on for our global audience as well i i just want to read out uh nine little achievements that they that you You have, you have made while you were in office, and and uh, of course I, I've already spoken about the first one, which was uh, you know guru sebagai fokus teras. Uh, secondly, you you I'm going to talk about manfaat pelajar P40. All right, you you have championed that uh, murid sebagai tonggak utama, komitmen tangani isu sekolah daif, perhatian penuh kepada OKU, kewibawaan institusi pendidikan tinggi. Peningkatan kerjasama dalam pendidikan tinggi, 
pemerkasaan bahasa, budaya dan sastra. And, and the last point to, to wrap up our session here, which is uh, so relevant, which is pendidikan teknikal dan latihan vocational. So, so it, it seems like, uh, you know, from, from the first minute until now, you, you have been telling us the truth that, that PVET was definitely in the agenda while you were in the office. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I hope, uh, you know, uh, the powers that be will, will, will look at this and, 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 and perhaps rethink the positioning of, of PVET in, in education in Malaysia. Yeah. Any last parting thoughts, YB? Uh, I've, I've talked a lot. <laughs> but anyway, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, for, uh, thank you to, the, uh, to listeners. And I hope that uh, one day we'll see a better Malaysia for not only for future generation, but also for us who are still living. <laughs> okay, thank you, Andrew. Okay, YB, just, just before you leave, I'm, I'm just going to do a quick thank you to, to all our speakers that, that are, uh, was with us since day one. Uh, of course, uh, YB, Dr. Mazli Malik, uh, we had Rashpin Pal Singh, uh, Ms. Craig Su Yen, Dr. Palvinder Singh, Chef Wan Sarima Ibrahim was also on the show Ooh. with us. Uh, we had our Australian friend, Con Sotidis. We had Craig Langley from the UK, uh, Joseph Fritner from Sweden, Serena Lee from Hong Kong, Gabriel Ekman from Rwanda, Tyler Chin from Malaysia, Dr. Sumitra Nair from MDAC Malaysia, Monica Chan from Singapore, Ramachandran Munyandi, uh, CEO of Asia Mobility, Technologist Dr. Chua Wenxian, who is with the Slango uh, Human Resource yeah. Development Center. Siobhan Hassan from Malaysia. Patrick Mabilok from uh, the Philippines. Felipe, Felipe Cofino, who is uh, in the east coast of the US. Rie Eichmann, who is uh, originally from Tokyo, but is now residing in Australia. And of course, our very popular Major Vandana Sharma, who is uh, an ex-military officer with the Indian Army. So ladies and gentlemen, we will see you again at Rejuvenate Edition 3 in August. And uh, we hope uh, we have all had a good time with Dr. Masli. Dr. Masli, um, saya mewakili uh, tim Rejuvenate edisi kedua ingin mengucapkan terima kasih kepada YB kerana telah meluangkan masa bersama kami uh, dan telah uh, memberikan banyak-banyak uh, input ya uh, mengenai uh, pendidikan dan situasi pendidikan di Malaysia uh, dan saya berharap uh, perbincangan kami pada hari ini memberikan impak uh, bukan saja kepada pendengar-pendengar dan, dan penonton-penonton kami di sini sekarang dan harap-harapnya untuk yang, you know, ber berkuasa uh, pada masa ini. Uh, there, there's a lot to learn, ya. Yeah. I, I, I think, uh, you know, we, we, we should be humble enough to to, to accept. Uh, I, I think YB has, has shown us that he, he has apologized profusely for not pushing some of his agenda, obviously, and, and, and not getting it done uh, perhaps right. Uh, the first time round, uh, but but again, just like everyone else here in Malaysia, we, we do hope for a, a better Malaysia. Uh, perhaps not for us, but obviously for the generations to come. And and with that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to close uh, Rejuvenate Edition Two. Uh, we are thankful to all our loyal uh, viewers and 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 audience from all over the world over the past three days and and we will be seeing you again in august where we will come back with the uh third edition of rejuvenate and, and with that uh yb um we wish you well uh we wish uh everyone to stay safe uh the, the whole of malaysia and, and we we hope that uh your time next week uh, when Parliament finally reopens, uh, is a fruitful one. Thank you. Thank you, YB. See you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everybody.